Ladies and gentlemen, hello. My name is Nigel Smith and I will be your moderator for this second webinar. Um, we have a distinguished panel of experts and four presentations. There will be a Q&A session after the fourth presentation. So if you want to ask questions, please use the Blue Jeans Q&A tool to let us know the questions. Of course, you can put your questions directly to our panelists, or if you prefer, I can ask on your behalf. So let's get things uh, underway straight away. Yves Poulet is our first speaker on the theme of addressing the latest challenges posed by profiling in an artificial intelligence era. Uh, Monsieur Poulet, you have 10 minutes, please. Thanks, Daniel. I hope it will correct. Yes, indeed. Everybody sees my slides, okay? Uh, not for the moment, no. Is that okay or not? I'm okay. not seeing your slides. No? Uh, very surprised because everything looks nice. Okay, Pahari, yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. You see it? Yes, we can see your slides. Thank you. Okay, nice. So I start immediately. Okay. So, okay, 10 years ago, the Council of Europe has adopted a recommendation on profiling. At that moment, that recommendation was welcome as an adequate answer to the development of profiling activities in different sectors, mainly for marketing purposes. Today, profiling is everywhere. As regards marketing, profiling is used not only for detecting adequate advertisement according to the consumer preference, but also for selecting consumers and adapting price. Profiling is broadly used within the medical sector. Employers make recourse to profiling for selecting their employees and evalu evaluating them. Administration are using profiling for defining strategy and for applying the public regulation. It is very clear that facial recognition is becoming a common tool for law enforcement agency in order to detect and to investigate. Politicians are using profiling techniques from better, better knowledge of their supporters of adapting their speech in order to maximize their chance to be elected. In all the sector, profiling is becoming a marvelous tool for optimizing and securing activities. That extension is largely due to the generalization of the use of learning, machine learning system, more and more powerful and connected with big data. This big data are collecting infinite number of data, trivial or not, anonymous, pseudonymized or not, and coming from sources more and more numerous. They are operating that collection through uh, a large number of sensors or terminals of all types within an interconnected world. In the extended report we have produced with Benoit Frenet, we are distinguishing a certain number of what we call artificial intelligence, supervised or not machine learning system, simple or deep learning. If nobody will deny the benefits of these new techniques, at the same time, people must be aware of the risk linked by these technologies in their current life. We need a new recommendation. We need new recommendation to face that extension of profiling activity and the new technology. Why? Because OI, 
artificial intelligence has substantially modified the functioning, the actors, and the risk of profiling. The first point is the fact that modern profiling is no more necessarily be linked with profile, defined as a set of data characterizing categories of individuals. More and more, the machine learning systems are directly applying to the individual the data they have collected and directly without the, any profile interface. Furthermore, modern profiling is based on models evolutive, based on statistical aggregation of vast amount of data, and no more on logic causation. It is quite clear that in most of the cases in machine learning system, there is no more logic behind the decision taken by this, this information system. Modern profiling is often functioning apart from complex and unpredictable interaction of neural networks, even if certain procedures of supervision, auditability or explainability might and ought to be used, the algorithms functioning remains more or less opaque. That opacity creates major risk, it's bias, and erroneous or inadequate programming are consciously or unconsciously possible. Beyond that, our report pinpoints the number of actors involved in the functioning of this system. The liability of these multiple actors has to be defined according to their effective participation. As regards actors, we have deserved a special attention to the role of what we have called online intermediary service, the information and communication platforms. As gatekeepers of information society, they, they are ideal place to collect data and establish profiles for themselves and their numerous subsidiaries or consumer or customer. Finally, modern profiling amplifies the risk faced by individuals risk of reductionism, risk of normalization, and in particular due to its predictive capacity, the risk of stigmatization and of manipulation of citizens. Beyond this risk covered by traditional data protection legislation, modern profiling creates collective risk at different levels. Collective risks which are not taken or only taken partly into consideration by data protection legislation. Cambridge Analytica is an example of the fact that profiling might be used as a way to challenge our democracy. One-to-one -one insurance is another example of the principle of mutualization, which is the core principle of the insurance sector, is called into question by AI system. Last point, big data analysis are no longer gathered about when specific data or small groups of people, but rather about large and undefined groups and leads to elaborate new categories of people totally in unpredictable. So, to be short, the problem of profiling shift progressively for a problem of data protection, individualist data protection, to uh, groups protection, taking into account more and more the question of social justice and discrimination. The, these types of findings pose a difficulty under data protection legislation, which is only concerned with the protection of, um, of individuals and leaves groups protection issues into the shadow. Second measure, reason to adopt new recommendations. Is the legislative evolution. The documents, to the extent that they apply or aimed a profiling activity, deserve to be taken into account. I just pin, pinpoint three documents from the Council of Europe itself. Definitely, the revision of the Convention 108 has to be taken into account. But more important are for my 
But my point of view, the two guidelines issued by the consultative committee, one on big data, the second one on artificial intelligence. I quote, and you see on the slide, a passage highlighting the need to move beyond a purely individualistic approach as regards the risk associated with emerging technology. It is as regard EU, it is quite interesting to see that EU GDPR has taken again the Council of Europe recommendation on the pro of profiling and certain provision about the duty to inform about the logic behind an automated decision. And they have added the right of an explanation and finally have defined a certain number of provisions about high risk profiling system which have to be under Article 35 be evaluated through a PIA procedure. More important, the three last years, a lot of recommendation and regulatory texts of different nature have been produced about the ethical question and principle which have to govern artificial intelligence activity. Among them, I have especially I want especially to get your attention on the EU Parliament resolution, very recent, 20, 21st of April of this year. And this uh, resolution is containing a certain number of ethical principles which must be uh, which must be applied in the evaluation of uh, the different artificial intelligence systems. So. We come to the new regulatory news, and I pinpoint only three main points as we have this uh, avenue, this new regulatory avenues. The first one is the enlargement of the scope, enlargement of the scope of the recommendation of providing. And you see that I have uh, proposed, we have proposed as Bureau of the Consultative Committee to enlarge. Uh, the objective not only uh, to protect the right to privacy but also the imperatives of social justice, cultural diversity and, and diversity and democracy. And you see two consequences, uh, the, the fact that uh, my, uh, my point of view, uh, the supervisory authority has to work, to collaborate with uh, other authorities and definitely that they have to extend their analysis to uh, collective risk and not only to individual, individualistic risk. As regards the second point, there's the fact that the uh, machine uh, learning system. Uh, yeah, uh, I have. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Running... I know that. I, so I, I will just finish. So the must be regulated and controlled, and we have proposed a certain number of ways to control. Uh, especially the high risk profiling system. And finally, the third point is reinforcement of data subject rights. No manipulation, the, the right uh, to have the possibility to opt in to profiling and to the choice when there is different profiling purpose of degrees. Uh, and you see uh, the possibility to have non profiled access by default uh, as regard certain information studies. That's, that's all. I, I will just put the conclusion. And you see, my conclusion is to say that we need trust in our more and more profiling society. society. And I, I give four ways by which this trust, that trust might be created. OK, so I finish there. I'm sorry, I, uh, I over. Uh, merci, merci beaucoup, okay. Monsieur Poulet. No problem. Thank you. No for, problem at all. I think anybody who's been following the events in the United States over the last uh, month or so knows just how timely uh, the points that you made are. Uh, thank you for setting the table. Now let's go to uh, Wojciech Wiwarowski. Uh, Wojciech, you have 10 minutes, please. Thank you very much. I hope you hear me well. Uh, Wojciech Wiwirowski, the European Data Protection Supervisor, 
uh, I will have the opportunity to say a few words about the practical use of the uh, artificial intelligence in order to make the profiling of the persons based on their uh, personal data and uh, uh, the use which probably we are not uh, uh, we are not expecting uh, on everyday basis and something which is also connected with the works of the uh, council of europe not only in typical uh, field of uh, uh, data protection and profiling itself but also on the uh, in the works uh, of the uh, on the judiciary and uh, its uh, independence because that uh, judiciary and the possibilities of use the, the artificial intelligent techniques in order to profile the judges and profile the people who are taking part in the uh, in the um, judicial actions uh, will be the main field of uh, uh, my interest today. As you know, the European Data Protection Supervisor is the supervisory authority of the European Union. European Union uh, institutions, bodies and agencies. We are not over the data protection authorities in the countries. Uh, there are two, still 27 jurisdictions in, the, uh, in this field in the European Union, but the, the European Data Protection Supervisor uh, is supervising the institutions, bodies and agencies of the EU, and also consulting and advising in the legislative process uh, of in the European Union. And that's the place where we are touching the problems uh, which uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, today. Uh, I'm not going to talk about uh, singularity or the take, uh, taking uh, of the, the human place by the robots. I'm talking about the things which are going on in practice right now and which are not that new for the lawyers as well. Uh, because all these uh, features that were used as artificial intelligent ones in order to collect, understand and uh, process the data uh, in the legal field that have been here for a number of years and uh, the, the famous conference on artificial intelligence and law uh, last year had a 39th annual edition so the lawyers are working on that on the, uh, uh, for the long time i will not look at the subject from the point of view of the justice itself and the, in the the courts although you can see that uh, some of the actions uh, uh, connected with artificial intelligence and the use it for the, uh, for the, 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 from the position of the judge are also present in the European systems. We have hundreds of the uh, companies uh, which start to include different kinds of legal texts where the artificial intelligence is the goal, but actually the tool because we are thinking about something which is not really artificially intelligent, which is just the tool in order to uh, assess the statistics, assess the statistical data, the big resources of data, and to use them in order to make the system operating better. And uh, also the Council of Europe uh, is uh, seeing this problem and the problem of artificial intelligence in the service for the judiciary have been also the, the, the uh, subject of the conference organized by the Council of Europe. But when we want to say about the profiling as a part of the story, we have to say that last five years, uh, we made a shift from the typical in, uh, information retrieval systems for lawyers and the expert systems for lawyers into the world where there are the assistants, uh, legal assistants uh, for the lawyers. Legal assistants who uh, the, uh, the, the artificially intelligent legal assistants whose uh, uh, role is to collect and to go through the big resources of data in order to find out which of them can be used in the solving of the problems. And this is not only information retrieval, this is not only the discovery on the facts and the forensic tools, but also this third part of the story. So description and analysis of the behavior of both the people who are the parties in the case, but also the judges and the members of jury. In Europe, this is not that much visible yet, but in the United States, especially from 2015, it started to be a big market. And this big market includes the predictive systems as well, like Lex Machina, which tries to assess the outcome of the lawsuits, but also premonitions, 
which try to assess which lawyer will win against which judge. So this is nothing more than the, uh, than the assessment done uh, automatically on the data which is collected from the hundreds of thousands of cases that uh, happened so far, and not only the judgment, but also dissenting opinions. So how likely is the judge to grant or deny the specific motion? How long the case take to terminate, to get to the trial, to get the claim construction hearing before the judge? How likely is that the judge is to find the patents, trademark, copyright infringement, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The other example, all the opinions of the judge collected in one place. All the cases the judge was cited in the opinions of collected in the uh, system. The frequency with which the judge cites specific circuits, judges and cases. So we can find the, the places where the judge itself, himself or herself is looking to in order to prepare his or her opinion. And that all creates the profiles that can be then collected together and give either the graphic explanation of what the, the, the uh, certain judge is doing, or they be used in taking the real decision by the by the company. And that's the point that I would like to touch as the most important, because this is the hidden way of profiling having an uh, having a big impact on the access to the justice, access to the court, uh, and the possibility to get uh, uh, the real support. To, uh, the, uh, moreover, this kind of impact is not seen by the judges themselves. The judges are absolutely un, uh, uninformed about the fact that the people who are the who are uh, the parties in the case have been or not uh, served by the lawyers who were assessing the judges. So the assessment of the judges uh, or the jury in the systems which have a jury uh, affected uh, in the help or the lack of help well, or lack of assist uh, for the people who are in the court. That was uh, the that was the uh, most important thing which happened last year so when the uh, legal profession started to actively use artificial intelligence tools in order to find out uh, uh, to, to find out how it can make more economical their appearance in the court. And let me finish this uh, presentation. With something which once again comes from the Council of Europe and one of the actions which is taken by the Council of Europe uh, uh, in the European judge, uh, uh, judge Training Network, where one of the parties, one of the uh, groups which are taking part in the, uh, in, uh, the preparation of the materials for this uh, network, uh, has uh, found and uh, recalled uh, the original meaning of the word jurisprudence and the prudence in this jurisprudence. The prudence that, that, that we should have when we are assessing the future, re, uh, the future uh, results of the profiling. Prudence, according to Cicero, is a knowledge of things uh, which are good and or bad, or neither good nor bad. Its parts are memory, intelligence, and foresight. Memory is the faculty by which we, uh, which the mind recovers the knowledge of the things which have been. So these are the resources that we get at. Intelligence is that we, by which it perceives uh, what exists at present, and that's an artificial intelligence tool. And the foresight is something to leave for us when we are deciding how the justice prudence will look like in the future. It's that by which anything is seen to be about to happen before it does happen. Profiles collected, uh, organized on the knowledge we have uh, will have an impact uh, on the societal, uh, societal um, issues, uh, including the judgments of the courts. Thank you very much, uh, Wojciech. Um, to those following us on Blue Jeans, don't forget that you can 
uh, send us your questions or certainly let us know that you want to ask questions by using the Blue Jeans Q&A tool. Uh, let's continue now with uh, a presentation by Gabriella Zanfir Fortuna. Uh, Gabriella, can you hear me? Yes, indeed, I can hear you, Nigel. And hello, everyone. Yes? Hello, you have 10 minutes, Gabriella. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to uh, my predecessors who, who gave us incredible, valuable, uh, incredibly valuable insight into what uh, profiling has become you know, nowadays. So um, unfortunately, I have not prepared a PowerPoint presentation, and, and in a way, I suppose my um, contribution is more of an intervention than a presentation. Uh, but I would like to give you a bit of um, insight into what has been going on in the United States uh, recently in terms of looking at profiling um, and um, you know attempts to reining it in um, and, and uh, so on. But before that, um, I would like to go back to something that Professor Poulet said earlier, because uh, I could not, um, you know, I could not not notice that he referred to profiling uh, as being modern profiling. And I think he is absolutely right in identifying the need to um, work on our vocabulary when we are talking about profiling. Uh, I do believe that AI has almost made speaking of profiling absolute, um, because the complexity of uh, the effects that what's happening with automated decision making um, for our societies and for our individual uh, rights uh, is, is just uh, perhaps too much to be described uh, by referring to a, a notion that, uh, you know, entered our um, sort of um, public policy debate uh, more than a decade decade ago. And uh, at that time, just as Professor Poulet was mentioning, uh, we were thinking primarily uh, uh, of profiling when marketing um, strategies. But now, uh, what has been happening in the society and um, what the AI uh, and the big data brought to profiling, uh, perhaps, you know, needs to um, be defined uh, as, as somehow um, differently. Now, uh, I also observed in Professor Poulet's uh, intervention uh, that he referred to collective harms as, uh, or, or harms for the society as something that we start to, to, to take into account when we're talking about profiling. Um, and this is indeed something that um, has been preoccupied us at the Future of Privacy Forum uh, for a while now, too. Uh, first of all, also, I, I apologize for not introducing myself at the very beginning. I just jumped uh, at the opportunity to uh, speak. Uh, so I am Gabriela Zampio Fortuna, Senior Counsel for the Future of Privacy Forum, which is a think tank based in Washington, D.C., uh, but also has an office in Europe. And uh, we are uh, tech optimists, but do believe in responsible data practice. Well, in 2017, uh, my colleagues uh, published a report uh, called Unfairness by Algorithms, and I invite uh, the audience here to um, give it a, a look. Uh, you will find it on our website, fpf.org. And what's interesting about that report is that it actually tries to categorize uh, the harms that are uh, potential, uh, potentially brought by automated decision making based on algorithms. And what we've done in that report is that we categorize these harms into individual harms and collective harms. And I fully support uh, this new um, initiative and modernization of the uh, Council of Europe's recommendation uh, on profiling from 2010 to be shifting into um, looking at collective harm and um, you know, th th these harms that society as a whole um, suffer. I would even say that uh, what's happening with um, this type of systems right now uh, have a transformational effect on society, uh, and, and we need to pay attention to that. Uh, now, as for uh, profiling and the uh, U.S. legislative framework, well, there are a, a couple of things to say about that, and we were preparing for this session. Um, I understood that it would be of interest uh, for, for this audience here to have insight into 
uh, what's been going on um, in this area uh, in the uh, U.S. Um, as of late. Well, first of all, the U.S. legal system, um, you know, it's not complete. It's not completely foreign to the idea of uh, protecting individuals that are subject to profiling. And um, as um, I'm really passionate of, um, of, of looking into the history of data protection law, I also want to bring an, um, an example here with the Fair Credit Reporting Act of 1970 in the United States, uh, which is literally a data protection law that's only applying to um, credit reporting agencies and credit reporting bureaus, and which was actually prompted by the uh, practice of profiling potential um, consumers for banks and other financial institutions. And, um, you know, the society reacting to that as feeling that it might be unfair. Um, frankly, uh, what was happening back then, back then was that specialized agencies were collecting information about couples that lived out of wedlock, alcohol consumption habits, all sorts of information that they were compiling, and there was no, um, they were creating pro consumer profiles uh, for potential debtors, and there was nothing to rein that in. And this is when Congress acted uh, and intervened and adopted the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Uh, which is based on uh, the fair information principles, um, practice principles. So this is not, you know, completely uh, uh, protecting individuals uh, in, in the face of uh, unfairness by profiling is not foreign to the uh, U.S. legal framework um, at all. However, um, you will not see a lot of other specialized laws like this that go directly to the core of uh, creating profiles and protecting individuals uh, in, in the face of profiling. Um, and, or at least you could not have seen uh, that in, in the past you know, 30, 40 years or so. Um, however, right now, when we are living a, a very, very important moment here in the U.S. in terms of thinking about uh, privacy legislation, uh, we are starting to see a lot of preoccupation for different facets of profiling. Uh, to give you an example, the uh, California Consumer Privacy Act, which is a state law that um, became applicable in January of this year, uh, and actually uh, its enforcement officially starts today. Well, the California Consumer Privacy Act um, defines personal information very broadly uh, to cover inferences that are drawn from other information about um, identified individuals uh, and uh, information that you know is used to create a profile about a consumer um, based on behavior, attitudes, um, and, and so on. This is really remarkable because uh, prior to the CCPA, it wasn't very often that uh, U.S. privacy laws in the different sectors that they were uh, regulating um, covered a broad definition of uh, personal information. So this is actually a very uh, important development, and um, individuals that are residents of California are granted rights to uh, opt out for from selling such inferences, so such uh, you know, profiles about them, um, and are granted rights to access uh, this personal information and also uh, rights to ask for erasure of this personal information under certain conditions. Uh, what's very interesting is that um, the CCPA has you know, chances to actually be modified uh, soon through a ballot initiative, which is um, a, a, akin to a referendum type of law that has been recently approved to appear on the ballot uh, for, for um, the elections that will take place in November. Um, and this new ballot initiative for the California Privacy Rights and Enforcement Act defines profiling uh, as part of its uh, definitions. And it has a similar definition than uh, with what we are seeing in uh, the GDPR. So this is certainly uh, a development to watch what's happening with the new ballot initiative in California. I'm mentioning these California laws because they are 
um, baseline privacy laws, um, the first baseline, well, the CCPA, the first baseline privacy law that's, uh, that has been adopted in the US. One last development before uh, finalizing is um, something that's happening at state level in Washington state, which is uh, you know, the state uh, in the northwest part of uh, the US where Seattle is, it's not uh, Washington DC. Well, Washington state very recently signed uh, into law um, a facial recognition law that requires government agencies to obtain a warrant to run facial recognition scans uh, except in case of um, emergency, when they can do this without a warrant. And there are some other requirements uh, over there as well. I mentioned this because, you know, with my first plea to think of profiling and maybe create new vocabulary around it, um, you know, we need to take into account new technologies like facial recognition and other AI-based and machine learning-based technologies in order to be able to create um, a legal framework that protects the rights of individuals and that um, protects fairness in uh, society as a whole. Well, that would be my intervention uh, right now, and I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Thank you very much, Gabriella. I'm sure that in the questions, uh, some people may want to pick you up about uh, what Europe can learn from the current conversation in the US around this issue of profiling in the AI era. Uh, but for our last presentation, let me go now to Associate Professor Alessandro Mantellero. Uh, Alessandro, can you hear me? Yes, thanks. You have 10 minutes. Perfect, thank you. So thank you for inviting me, and uh, I'm here to share some uh, few ideas about uh, the... Uh, I think that the video is not so... We can see you. Yeah, okay, perfect. Uh, I want to share some few ideas and uh, consideration about uh, the topic of profiling in, in general. And uh, I will do that uh, with uh, different hats. The first is, of course, my academic background. The second is the fact that uh, I had the pleasure to work with uh, the uh, Convention 108 Committee on the uh, guidelines on artificial intelligence that were adopted at the beginning of uh, 2019. And, uh, and the last point is uh, the ongoing work at the uh, high level, the ad hoc committee on artificial intelligence that is working on artificial intelligence related topic, including, of course, also profiling. So starting from the beginning, I think that uh, both in the, uh, the profiling recommendation and uh, also in a lot of the debate around uh, data protection in general, there is a lot of focus on the individual profiling and more in general than the individual dimension. And I think that we should also consider the collective dimension in the use of data. Collective dimension doesn't mean only the sociological impact or the social issues, but the fact that more and more data are not used to profile individuals, but to profile group, to profile a large scale of people, in many cases, not necessarily using personal data, but using aggregate information. And this is something that we have seen also recently with the COVID uh, pandemic experience, uh, where we had used uh, large scale data in order to extract information about uh, um, some patterns, for instance, of uh, mobility, etc. So I think this is an, a point that should be further investigated and debated also from a regulatory perspective. Um, the second point is uh, about the relationship that uh, there is uh, between uh, the profiling uh, approach of the Council of Europe and the approach that the Council of Europe has adopted uh, with regard to data protection and artificial intelligence. Uh, like in profiling, um, profiling is uh, a part, if you want, of artificial intelligence in this sense, uh, also in the, in the draft recommendation, there are many references to artificial intelligence. Because our, our artificial intelligence can use also can be used also for for profiling pur purposes, but uh, I think that when we deal with this kind of issue, in many cases uh, our approach is uh, in the debate uh, is very focused on the traditional instruments that we have. So transparency, for instance, that is very debated, or consent and self determination. 
Of course, these are key points also in the Convention 108 are fundamental uh, aspects of the Convention. But I, I think that uh, there are some constraints, some limitation in terms of the, the opportunity to, to obtain a result based only on these aspects. And uh, I think that uh, there are other elements that should be uh, considered and also uh, may play a more relevant role. Uh, for instance, uh, the role of expert and the role of co-design. This is something that is not uh, well investigated, uh, but uh, in practice there are many experience of a committee of experts that support companies. And I think this is a, an important topic because uh, when we consider profile, we consider profile to to make decision in many cases, uh, and also was in the previous presentation. And if you want to make decision, you have to understand the system. You have to understand the impact. You need something more than only a, a number of uh, computer scientists. You need an expert from other fields in order to better set the framework. Because the risk of profiling, and more in general, the risk of artificial intelligence is a broader risk. It's not only the bias in data, but is the bias also in the manner in which you frame the research question, uh, the bias regarding the methodology that you use to extract values from data. So all this stuff cannot be addressed without having a multidisciplinary approach in addressing these issues and the consequence of applying this system in society. Uh, in this sense, if uh, the, the, there's a sort of interaction between who created the system and the target, so the group and society, I think it's very important to have also a more inclusive approach. This means having a participatory approach. A participatory approach means that when you want to create a smart city system, for instance, this should not be something top-down created by the municipality and the big company that provide a service, but should engage actively the citizen in the shape of the system. And this is also relevant uh, not only from a human rights perspective, because participation is an important uh, right in, in, the, in the framework, uh, but it's also important in order to increase awareness and to better detect what is a key element, I think, in terms of uh, regulation and also in, in order to address the challenges of uh, artificial intelligence and profiling, which is the risk. Risk, risk assessment, risk management is a very important uh, instrument to manage and potential counsel more than other traditional aspects for instance you can have transparency but then you need to understand what is the consequence and how to manage the consequence you can have consent but a consent without awareness without awareness about the risk and the ability to manage this risk is useless so the risk assessment is very important and we need to have a more participatory debate and participatory approach to the risk assessment Another important point is that is, uh, all these points are in, in the guidelines is the algorithm vigilance. Algorithm vigilance, it means when we create an algorithm and we put it in the, in the market or in society, uh, the job is not finished. Uh, all what the stuff about uh, data protection by design, et cetera, human rights by design is not finished. The algorithm are able to learn. So it means that they change over the time can change because the data change, et cetera, or there are new issues. And so we should maintain a sort of vigilance in order to check what happens in using this algorithm in concrete scenarios. And the last point that is also addressing in the, the guidelines adopted by the Council of Europe on artificial intelligence and data protection is the role on the public actors. Public actors can play an important role in this game because uh, through the public procurement, so the public sector, may ask a different kind of approach, a more human rights oriented approach, a more risk uh, focused approach, et cetera. I, I think this is important. This is important also to focus on a human rights approach that is something different, I think, from the human centered approach that is frequently proposed. Because a human centered is something that is not human rights. To have a focus on humans is something, to have a focus on the rights and the freedoms, their fundamental freedoms is different. And uh, another point that I want to touch on this also in the guidelines is the fact that uh, 
and a lot of this system based on profiling and also on artificial intelligence are not a fully automated system. So there is a role of the decision maker at the end of the analysis carried out by the artificial intelligence. And, uh, and there is a lot of emphasis on the, the human in the loop, uh, also in the VR, for instance, but uh, I think that here there is a problem. And the problem is uh, the concrete freedom of choice of this uh, human decision maker. Because uh, in many cases, uh, dealing with uh, a machine that is able to process uh, billions of data in a very short time and to extract inferences is not so easy in terms of uh, capacity, in terms of ability to make the same process with the human brain, and it's not so easy in terms of freedom of decision, because if you say that the machine is wrong, then you accept to take the responsibility for the decision. And so with the fact that the decision maker might be very conservative, they can prefer in many cases to follow the decision of the machine. The last point is about the ongoing work at the CAI level. The CAI level is working on a future regulation of artificial intelligence, and in this sense, there are several aspects that are, are relevant. As mentioned, for instance, the interaction between artificial intelligence and justice that pose important problems, not only in terms of profiling uh, the member of the courts, but also in terms of quality of arms between you and a court that use artificial intelligence tools, also not only in the decision, but also in the investigation. And the last point in this contest is also the fact that when we use artificial intelligence in the court decision, it will be very important to define which is the role played by these artificial intelligence tools and how they interact with the final decision. So this is uh, the framework. This is the framework. There are many issues and probably to address these issues, the best way is to follow the path that is already in the, in the data protection approach. So a sort of co-regulation, some binding rules and some soft law instrument like the guidelines on profiling, the guidance of artificial intelligence that can, can complete and provide flexibility to the framework. These are a few tools. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alessandro. Um, as you can imagine, there's been a lot of interest in this subject online, so I'm going to come uh, to the questions in a moment. But we do have a comment from uh, Benoit Frenet, who is a machine learning researcher and co-author of the Council of Europe report on profiling. Uh, Benoit, what's your point, please, to the panellists? Thank you. Um... Actually, we'll be quite short. I uh, just want to highlight a few things. In the last 10 years, tools for providing have changed in an impressive way, as we already discussed. We saw the rise of deep learning, what allows more efficient face recognition, among others. We saw the expansion of machine learning in many domains like human resources, education, medicine, law, and so on. Natural language processing is now able to do amazing things that are not limited to natural language. For example, it can be applied to law. We saw new softwares and IT systems changing lives of workers and citizens. However, this is only the beginning and this transformation has already raised questions in many aspects that we already discussed during the last hour. For those reasons, I believe that the work done by the Council of Europe is important. Lawyers, computer scientists and others must work together produce laws and recommendations that address societal issues in a relevant way. Technology may not be natural, but it's also more and more complex, and a deep understanding of it requires advanced skills, for example, in computer science, algorithms, mathematics, and so on. I believe that the only way to provide a, provide a meaningful analysis of profiling is an interdisciplinary approach, as highlighted by Alessandro. After the recommendation proposal that Ispule and myself hold, we received many comments. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the members for providing enlightening remarks as well as supportive comments on scientific research and education, which are more than ever needed. Without further ado, I yield the floor to the questions and answers. Uh, thank you, Abdul uh, 
Um, what I'll do now, I'll try to share around the questions to our panelists. So, Professor Poulet, if I can come back to you. We've got a question here from Nicola Fabiano, who is the DPA of San Marino. Um, the question is, regarding paragraph B, page 512, very precise, uh, how is it yeah. possible <laughs> in practice and mainly referring to an algorithm to work on correcting and limiting the risks. If you can make your answer uh, as succinct as possible, please. Uh, I'm sorry. So it, it is a comment about Article 5. That's what you say. Yes, yeah? it's, it's uh, regarding paragraph B, page 5.12, uh, I think it is. How is it uh, possible point, in point. practice and mainly referring to an algorithm to work on correcting and limiting the risks? I think there are a certain number of uh, methods in order to correct and to limit the risk linked with artificial intelligence systems. Uh, definitely, Benoit has more information there about, but definitely, I, I think supervision, for example, and the fact that you and that you have before to launch an information system, you have you have to experiment this information system and to and to check if the re results, the outcomes are correct, is definitely a first uh, first way. The second uh, the second uh, possibility is definitely to ex uh, to um, introduce a certain number of constraints in order to to um, forbid a certain number of, uh, of illegal uh, questions. For example, as we get racial uh, information, it is quite clear that you might uh, introduce certain constraints in order, in order to, to forbid uh, the use of racial, uh, of racial uh, data. Uh, another problem is definitely that you have to document uh, very, very precisely uh, the data you give, uh, for example, uh, the fact that they are updated, uh, the fact that they are complete, the fact that they are covering uh, the population and not a certain category of population. So there are a certain number of things uh, that we have to take into account. And that's why I totally agree with Alessandro. I think with um, the problem of profiling, we must have a more important look about the procedure of assessment. And I think in our recommendation, we have uh, extended uh, the, the provision about the, the absolute needed to have an assessment, uh, which is multidisciplinary, which is multi-stakeholders. Uh, and I think when I see the evolution as regards the EU Parliament resolution, that it is important that the member states will have to create a sort of a laboratory in order to label algorithms and artificial intelligence systems. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Professor, for your answer. Let me now bring uh, bring back uh, Wojciech to our conversation. Uh, Wojciech, we've got a question here from uh, Stephen Vosloo, who's following on Blue Jeans. Um, I hope this one. I hope you feel comfortable answering this question. Could you please explain what opting out could look like in the age of machine learning and already trained algorithms used for piloting? Not an easy thing. Uh, I, I think the first uh, and the most important part uh, in this uh, uh, scenario that I was talking about was the lack of information at all that such uh, profiling is going on. And uh, that's uh, probably the most important uh, uh, thing, that uh, neither the judges nor the parties had a clue that uh, they, they were profiled or they are profiled in order to take uh, any kind of decisions. But of course, the question is about opting out from the, from the databases like that. To be frank, uh, it's very hard for me to imagine that a company which is trying to do this uh, such a uh, such a the, such a system such an information system that would uh, collect and uh, sort this data will have a the special uh, uh, let's say blacklist of those who are not profiled but uh, of course according to the uh, to the GDPR 
and according to the European solutions, this uh, right of the person has to be followed. So the kind of the dashboard for the uh, legal tech companies uh, might be probably the way to do that, uh, but the, the way to uh, deal with it. Uh, otherwise, uh, the list like that would have to appear on the level of each of the company. Uh, thank you, Wojciech. Uh, let me now go to um, Gabriella. Gabriella, we've got a question here from Remy Diogo. Uh, he asks, what are the real risks and impacts of fully trusting AI and automated systems to make decisions and categorizing data for us simply based on profiling? Uh, he then goes on to say, what bad outcomes could come from it in, from a societal point of view? What are your thoughts on that? Well, the... Um, absolutely, we need transparency, first of all, and this is this goes back to, to Wojciech's point earlier that, um, you know, what, what the key issue about being able to opt out or, or having any sort of, of control about what's happening is to first know that something is happening. So, um, I think knowing that something is happening and then having um, some control about uh, profiles and automated decision making are absolutely essential. Um, and fully trusting AI systems, you know, this can be def uh, defined in so many ways. What should we actually understand by fully trusting AI system? Fully trusting, you know, their creators, the coders, fully trusting the neural network and, and really understand how that works right now. Um, so, you know, I, I think that um, we, we actually need some safeguards of, of which transparency uh, is, is absolutely key in order to um, be able to um, not suffer the kind of harms that um, I, I mentioned. And since this was another part of the question, what are exactly uh, the harms? Um, I, I'm just going to quote from the report that I, I was mentioning, but we categorize them in, in different um, buckets. So we have like loss of opportunity, uh, economic loss, social detriment, and loss of liberty um, as well. And under each of these categories, we look both at, at, at individual harms and at um, collective harms, uh, such as differential access to job opportunities. This is certainly one of the um, concerns uh, differential access to insurance and benefits, differential access to housing, differential access to education. Um, so, so this, you know, there, there are, re, um, there is an entire palette of societal harms uh, that uh, can happen. Uh, thank you, Gabriella. Let me uh, throw back to um, Professor Alice uh, Mantelero. Um, Kate Francis asks, do you think that carrying out a human rights impact assessment and establishing an ad hoc committee can be enforceable? How can we ensure that committees and assessments are genuine and not just some kind of ethics washing by companies? I think that's a, a very important point. So how would you respond yeah. to Kate Francis' question? Thank you. I, I've sent a, sh a comment uh, to Kate's uh, question. But uh, I share uh, uh, the feedback in general. I think that uh, there is a, a distinction. Uh, one thing is to create uh, an ethics board uh, or any kind of board only for uh, brand uh, reputation or something like that. And there is clear cases of ethic washing. Other things is to create a human rights impact assessment and the use uh, expert committees with different kind of expertise to better carry out this impact assessment. This is my personal approach. And this is also the approach that you can find in the big data guidelines of the Council of Europe and then the uh, partially also in the uh, artificial intelligence guidelines. So the idea is that uh, this expertise on the committee is something that can be used to better the human rights impact assessment. And the human rights impact assessment is something that I personally working on it, but there are many other people that are working on the human rights impact assessment in order to make human rights assess, impact assessment more adequate to the specific context of artificial intelligence and uh, of uh, data intensive application. This is not so easy, but I think if I may also 
connect this answer to what's said by, by Gabriella, I think that uh, this is also the, the core of the European approach, European in general. The focus on human rights, the focus on the risk in terms of impact on rights, rather than the focus on harms. Harms is different from the uh, risk in terms of impact on rights and freedoms. Arms can be interpreted in many different manner. And um, we should remember, and there is also something different in the recent documents of the European Union. We should remember that in the GDPR, in the Convention 108, the, co the definition of risk is risk in terms of impact on fundamental rights and freedoms. Um, harms is a different notion and uh, uh, can be good or can be bad, it depends, but of course it's a different kind of approach and we should be aware of that also in the new um, documents adopted by the Commission in which there is a lot of reference to arms and risk and a bit less to human rights in terms of risk for human rights. Uh, thank you, Professor. We are uh, officially at the end of our time, but there is such an interest in this. I'm just wondering if the panellists can just stay an extra 10 minutes or so. Would that be okay? Excellent. Well, I've got a question which uh, I think uh, should go to uh, Professor Poulet and perhaps to uh, Benoit Frenet. It's a question from Marie-Georges. She asks, are the experts working on the revision of the 2010 recommendation on profiling using concrete AI cases dealt with by DPAs. And then she adds in parenthesis, for each case, description, identification of the problems, recommendations and positions. So it's a general question. What is your answer, please? We'll start with you, Professor Poulet, to begin with, please. So uh, first, my, uh, my best regards to uh, Marie. Okay. Uh, um, what concerns the, the, the question of uh, having a look at the different cases of AI system um, for uh, the DPA, I know different cases, uh, notably as regard the use of facial, facial recognition, as regard the problem of uh, uh, the, the famous Kneel uh, decision about the, the possibility for uh, people to, uh, for uh, students uh, to be uh, directed to a certain number of uh, education ways. Uh, I know, I know this case. Um, my my problem is definitely as regard DPA to know to what extent they are able to face with uh, what Alessandro has uh, said, what uh, Gabriella has said. It means uh, to what extent they are able to face a collective impact. Uh, I think data protection, and if you have a look at the GDPR, GDPR is uh, definitely concerning personal data and, and the protection of individuals as regards artificial intelligence and, um, and definitely profiling system. I think we, we, we are facing collective questions, collective risk, and my problem is to know to what extent it is possible for a data protection authority to have, to address these new issues and that's, for me that's a, a big problem in the recommendation we have proposed that dpa are extending their competence but i, I am not sure they are able to do that um, alone i think they have to cooperate and they have to cooperate with other authorities like definitely consumer association with uh, for example, equal opportunities, organization, and, and so. But that's my answer. Mm -hmm. I would maybe <clears throat> very briefly add, but if I understood correctly, the question is whether it's about whether we we used concrete case uh, from uh, DPA. Uh, at least from my side, what what I tried is to uh, be relevant with respect to what is really done in artificial intelligence and techniques that could be used with respect to profiling. So we, we try to to find the balance between law and computer science here. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, 
I think that should bring us to the end of this uh, panel discussion on uh, profiling in the AI era. Let me say thank you to Benoit for staying online for your comments, to, to Eve, to Alessandro, to Wojciech and to Gabriella. Uh, also to the people following on Blue Jeans who've sent in some very interesting questions. Uh, join us again tomorrow for day two of the Council of Europe's webinar series, Data Protection Views from Strasbourg. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>